Alright, this is our fourth video on general principles of orthopedic trauma. I'm going to talk a little bit about associated uh, injuries now and uh, a little bit about, um, uh, we'll also get into some case examples of uh, hip fracture and we'll also talk a little bit about the um, uh, some different types of fractures you may see. So fractures don't occur in isolation. Uh, some even say that a fracture is a soft tissue injury with a broken bone. So there's always a soft tissue injury when you have a fracture. Uh, neurovascular injury is not always obvious. It requires careful and repeated examination. Um, so when you see a patient, uh, you need to make sure that you rule out a vascular injury, uh, at least uh, by starting with these, uh, physical examination. Uh, keep in mind that nerve injury requires patient cooperation. So if you have a patient that comes in uh, and then they get intubated and you haven't done a careful neurologic examination, now you can't really communicate with them perhaps because they're sedated and they're intubated and um, your opportunity is lost. So it's very important to get careful examination early on. Also to look for changes over time. You don't, like if they come in and you didn't examine them properly or you just said they're wiggling their toes, but in fact, they were just plantar flexing the toes and not really dorsiflexing the toes. Uh, and now the next day, they're not dorsiflexing the toes. You, you don't know what it was like initially. Did this happen over time? Or is there something evolving right now? Or did they come in like that? Compartment syndrome is something that you want to look for. You obviously don't want to miss it. And it's not something you may see necessarily on presentation. And we'll talk about this in another lecture. A vascular injury can occur from penetrating or blunt trauma. It requires immediate diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and tissue death can occur within hours of warm ischemia. And so oftentimes you have to get a vascular surgeon involved. Uh, certainly this is a case with a lot of uh, bone loss in this distal femur. Here you can see the popliteal artery comes to an abrupt stop right here. Um, so clearly uh, we, we have a problem uh, with uh, arterial flow distally. So as I mentioned, neurologic injury uh, can occur with fractures. And to assess this, you need a cooperative patient. And you need careful and repeated examination. Uh, there are th sort of three degrees of nerve injury. Um, these are called, um, this is the sedin classification. Um, and um, the first uh, uh, grade is like a neuropraxia, often from a stretch injury. Uh, or compression type of an injury and you can cause sensory deficits uh, and frequently can recover. Um, an axonotmesis is when you have sensory and motor deficits and surgery may be needed, maybe not. Uh, and a neurotmesis is when the nerve actually is completely severed and disrupted physically. So you'll see this uh, on uh, during surgery, for instance. Uh, and it may require surgery to put the nerve back together, do a nerve grafting, or do something else, uh, because that nerve is likely not going to just spontaneously recover. So here an example of patient seated, maybe in a car crash, knee hits the dashboard, femoral head is driven posteriorly, here you can see the femoral head, here is the acetabulum, so you have a dislocation, fracture of the posterior wall occurring uh, as the head goes out, and then you can see the sciatic nerve here getting stretched. So Dr. Haydell is going to talk more at length on musculoskeletal infection, but a few words. It's a complication that is associated with trauma and operative management of fractures. Uh, it can be as simple as a cellulitis responding to antibiotics, or it could be a very deep infection with dead bone and sort of a disastrous situation as uh, shown in this image here and very disabling. So pathologic fractures usually refer to a fracture that's occurring with a tumor. So uh, it's very important to get a good history. A patient may tell you they have known metastatic disease, let's just say, and it's happened in their other bones before. Um, they may tell you that there was minimal or no trauma. Maybe they said, you know, I've been having pain in my thigh for a couple of weeks. It happens when I walk. Even I get it at night. For, uh, and, and then I'm just walking and my leg just gave way. So a lot of times patients will come in and history is they had a fall. But if you really ask them carefully, they'll say, I didn't fall and break my femur, uh, which in and of itself uh, it should be questionable uh, for a femoral shaft fracture uh, because it usually takes more trauma to cause that. 
Uh, but if they can tell you, like, I didn't fall, I just, my leg gave way, and then I fell because my leg broke, um, that should be suspicious for a tumor. Uh, it can be due to weakening of a bone by a tumor or metabolic disease. Uh, just a word about osteoporotic fractures. Technically, some will refer to them as pathologic fractures because the bone is abnormal. But most osteoporotic fractures occur uh, in the setting of some type of low energy trauma, unless there's very severe osteoporosis, in which case a fracture can occur without trauma. And here in this x-ray, you can see there's this lesion causing thinning of that medial cortex, uh, a little scalloping of the lateral cortex, and now there's a fracture that's occurred here. Um, so this is an example of a pathologic femoral shaft fracture. It could be due to a known metastatic disease, unknown metastatic disease, or a primary bone tumor. And uh, multiple myeloma is one example of a sort of separate type of bone tumor, um, but uh, most other bone tumors are uh, things like um, Ewing's sarcoma, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, etc. Um, uh, secondary uh, tumors are metastatic, and these are most common. So a patient has lung cancer, it's metastatic to bone, and now they have a pathologic fracture, um, as an example. And uh, metabolic uh, bone disease, um, and we mentioned osteoporosis as sort of being a pathologic fracture, but uh, Paget's disease, hyperparathyroidism uh, are other examples. So in a young patient with a very aggressive appearing lesion, um, it doesn't have any known primary cancer, you may have to think that maybe it's a primary bone tumor. In this case, and I won't get into too much detail, you have other, I think, lecture on this. There's sort of a poor zone of transition, a very aggressive appearing lesion with a lot of bone loss here. Um, and you may have what's called periosteal reaction where the body's bone is trying to react and make new bone in response to the bone destruction. Paget's disease has thickened cortices, trabecula, bowing deformities, and you can get fractures. And the fractures, like shown here, can have, because of the, the bone metabolic disease, they can have a difficult time healing as well. Metastatic disease, as I said, is the most common uh, type of uh, pathologic fracture. It occurs usually in older patients, not so much in, in younger patients. And the femur and humerus are very common appendicular sites. So a few words about osteoporosis. Um, it's a decrease in bone density with normal bone mineralization, which is different than osteomalacia and vitamin D deficiency. Uh, here are some of the risk factors you should be aware of uh, that can uh, cause osteo or be associated with osteoporosis. And they can lead to fractures. So hip fractures are just an example. And these and other fragility fractures are increasing in incidence. Uh, the bone is thin. So when you fix these things, uh, it can be difficult to achieve stable fixation. Um, uh, and there's you know, techniques we have to utilize uh, over uh, that go above and beyond our usual techniques to get stable fixation here. So if you have an elderly patient with a low energy hip fracture, they just trip and fall and have a broken hip um, or broken proximal femur, they, they, you know, they may have osteoporosis and should be evaluated and treated medically and that fracture may have been prevented with proper screening, bone density testing and treatment um, beforehand. So a few words about hip fractures. Uh, when we say hip fracture, usually you're referring, referring to a proximal femur fracture and not necessarily the acetabulum, although that's part of the hip joint. And those are the three types we'll go, we'll go, we'll go into a little bit. So a femoral neck fracture is a, an intracapsular fracture. So normally the capsule of the hip joint um, comes here. So any fracture that occurs in this area. So here it, they're, they're showing that there's a non-displaced fracture line here. It's intracapsular, right? So here's another example. This one's sort of an impacted fracture. Okay, and then you have down here, these two cases are displaced. These are displaced fractures. So um, because it's intracapsular, there's a lot of joint fluid. Callus has a hard time setting up shop. That is the new bone formation. Um, so healing can be slow. Uh, the blood supply to the femoral head is at risk, especially with displaced fractures, as is shown here. I uh, won't get into too much of the anatomy as to why that is, 
but it can lead to osteonecrosis, so the bone can die. So, um, and I'll sort of jump ahead a little bit. So, in those cases where you're worried that the bone is going to die and you have an elderly patient, you may want to consider just tossing that head in the trash and basically doing a joint replacement, either a partial or hemi joint replacement where you just put a new ball in or a total hip replacement where there's sort of this socket put in and this this ball on top of the metal stem. Um, if you have a fracture that's impacted or non-displaced, you may just want to fix it and not necessarily replace it by one of these techniques. Or if you have a young patient, 20-something year old patient with a displaced femoral neck fracture, you may not want to replace it because you will see in the hip and knee lecture, joint replacement is really not for the young uh, patients uh, if it can be avoided. So in, these, in those cases, you do your best job to fix it and uh, hope that you don't get osteonecrosis. So intertrochanteric fractures are extracapsular, so they actually tend to bleed more. That, that blood is not contained uh, like in the joint capsule, so it can actually bleed a lot. Uh, it's the most common type of fracture. This is actually an intact example here, but here you can see fracture line comes up this way, and you can see the second fragment, which is shortened and overlapped a little bit, is here. So you sort of have this fracture that goes from the greater to the lesser troch in this direction, this sort of obliquity, and that's an intertrochanteric fracture. It's not replaced, it's treated by fixing it by one of these type of methods, some type of plate and screw or intramedullary rod and screws. So I'm going to pause there and uh, we're going to talk about uh, non-unions in the, in the next video, when fractures don't heal.